Okay, I think we're ready to roll. Um, so I want to welcome you to this workshop on key line planning and silvopasture. I'm Michael Heller. I'm with the Maryland Razors Network and the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Um, it's going to be my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, Keith Olinger. And Keith is going to walk us through his farm metaphorically and also through his thinking and decision making process um, in implementing the key line system to fit his particular farm. Now we're going to save questions till the end. Um, what you can do is go to the bottom of your screen to the chat room. And you'll, um, what we would prefer is if you would send your questions via chat to Caroline and Michael. That way we won't be distracting too much and we can really focus on Keith's uh, presentation because it is full of me. You really have to stay focused. <laughs> <laughs> Keith, there you are. Uh, mm. Before we get started, I want to thank Caroline Sell and Future Harvest for their great support here. And also, I want to thank David Tanner and the Chesapeake Bay Foundation for hosting the Zoom here. So, let's get started. Keith's farm that we are visiting today is Portsview Farm. It's in Woodbine, Maryland, and Howard County. And online, I, I pulled off your, your um, motto, Keith. I just got such a kick out of it. The motto for the farm is saving the planet one meal at a time. I like that. So Keith is unquestionably one of Maryland's most creative and innovative farmers. We're lucky to have him. His family has been farming for more than 400 years. He's an activist, has served on so many different boards. He lists 22 here, uh, <laughs> councils, you name it. He has participated in the benchmark study on soils that Future Harvest and PASO are doing, the Breeding Bird Atlas, which appeals to me very much, Keith, in DC. Uh, he has a deep love of the planet, which comes through all the time. And his goal on the farm is to create a garden of Eden that is just bursting with life, a place that is profitable as a business, that supplies his family and the community with healthy food while supporting all of the natural ecology. Uh, turns out this month is your seven-year anniversary on the <laughs> yeah. so seven years. So mm. what we're going to see today was begun seven years ago. So welcome, Keith, and thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Michael. And I see a lot of names and faces that are familiar to me. It's, it's humbling and an honor to have you here. Um, what you're about to see is essentially the culmination of everything in my life up to this point. This was what we were working for for many, 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 many years. Um, and so I've tried to recreate it as best as I can for you. If you were coming here yourself to have a tour, the things you'd see, uh, we've got a lot to cover in about 45 minutes and then we'll have question and answer. So feel free to send your questions to Michael in the chat. I won't be able to see them, but He'll organize them at the end, and him and Caroline, everybody will, will work to, to get them to me. Um, so let me, uh, let me get started here. We're going to do the share screen and bring up the presentation. And... All right. Can everybody see that okay? Yeah, that's working well. All right, great. So today we're going to be doing just fine. Okay, great. All right. Um, so today, obviously, we're going to be talking about key line planning and civil pasture. Uh, my information is right there on the screen, and uh, it'll be available to you. So if anybody wants to talk about this, we can we can talk a little later, and we have a long time for questions as well. To get started, one of the primary objectives of key line planning is to enhance the swift development of deep biologically fertile soil in a systematically designed landscape. And when we talk about fertile soil, we're talking about the living soil. And that comes from Water for Every Farm, page one of P.A. Yeoman's book. In silvopasture, trees, animals, and forages for those animals are integrated as a whole system that is greater than just the sum of its parts. Now that's from a good book, uh, Silvopasture, page one by Steve Gabriel. 
And then in rotational grazing, livestock are moved to different portions of the pasture called paddocks while other portions rest. The intent is to allow the pasture plants and soil time to recover. So these are the key components that we're gonna be dealing with today in some of the definitions. From an overshot view of the farm, the portion that you can't see is just a, a long pipe stem driveway that has about 50 feet on either side of the driveway. But this is an overshot view of the farm as it looked um, before we even had boundary fences in. There was about three and a half acres that had been fenced in for horses. Those are the fences that you see there in the picture. The rest was mowed for yard. And then what I call the big sort of fat L, that, that field off to the side there, that was a hay field and that was it. So um, there was the house, the shop, the old barn, and then the fencing for the horses. And that was everything that was here. So it was essentially a blank slate when we got here in 2013. The, the small lines that you see in the larger part of the L there are actually the key lines, the swale and berm system that we put in there, six of them on that side of the farm. Um, and then the rest we planted in trees and put in fences and other things. So I'm gonna move to the next slide and this is gonna be a video tour. So if you had come today, this is what you would see. It's a shot of our neighbors here. That's our driveway. And then this is our neighbor's hay field. And as we come down the driveway here, you'll see all these trees planted on the side. Those are gonna be a living fence, similar to an English hedge. Um, we keep all the grasses as tall as possible. Um, that helps with sequestering rainfall and carbon. We have black locust, Washington hawthorn, yellow poplar, hazelnut, and northern red oak in those plantings there. Now they're all in tree tubes. There's about 7,500 of them planted on the farm. As we come through the upper gate here, you'll see our little tree farm sign hidden there by some Alanthus altissima, unfortunately. <laughs> um, here's what we call our wood chip road where we keep our wood chips that we get from a neighboring uh, tree care company. This is our orchard. As we come up through here, you'll see we have apples, peach, pear, plum, sour cherry, persimmon, mulberry. Those are our beehives. We do graze the animals in that area there. As you come up, you see the, our parking lot. This is where you would have parked. We have our shop in front of us. It's wood shop, metal shop, and our big freezer is in there. This is where we have the rams right now. That's our sport court that we put in, which came in well during the pandemic. That's another shot of the orchard. And then that's the house up here. We use those porta huts. We move them around the farm. And we'll back up here. We'll go back down the driveway. And what we do is during the year, as we prune and as trees come down in storms or limbs or whatever, we make piles. And then throughout the year, we'll address those piles. There's a small one off to the side there as we go by. We cut those up and we use them for firewood. We use them for charcoal to make biochar. These wood chips um, are species that are not toxic to our livestock because we use them for bedding and for mulch for all the trees. The trees that get the mulch are about twice as big as the ones that don't. We attribute that to the moisture retention and the mycorrhizal relationship. There's a shot of the mulching and the rows of trees. As we come up here on this side, you'll see Osage oranges are planted. So one side is the living fence with those five species that we mentioned. And the other side, the lower side that I'm passing on right now is Osage orange that we planted. We have an area that we go to and collect the pickup truck. It's a full size bed load of Osage orange pods every year. And then we plant them in any gaps. As we come up here to the house, this is the porch where we would have sat on to do the initial part of the tour. That's our firewood wagon. This is a swimming pool hot tub for when I need to relax after planting thousands of trees. That's our biochar pile. I had just made some charcoal uh, the night before. The kids cook out on it, and then I do, the, I do the charcoal while they don't know what's going on. Now this here, that's our, our dump trailer. We use that a lot uh, for hauling stuff in and hauling stuff out. And then that's our squeeze chute head gate, and we have a tub, uh, a tub gate for loading the animals when we take them to the butcher. We have a bud box that we just took apart back there with corral panels. That's where we keep some of our bobcat equipment 
in front of you, you'll see the uh, mobile chicken coops that we have. There's our compost windrow turner and our pig pens. We have 15 hogs, um, three boars, 12 sows. They're all about 700 pounds. This building is our blacksmith shop. There again is a shot of the windrow turner that we use to turn the compost pile. In our blacksmith shop, we have our welding equipment and our blacksmithing. These are some gates. That's the old barn. That's the new cattle barn. And this is a shot of our sawmill. There's a 30-foot beam, I-beam up there that allows us to put a 20-foot log uh, that's three foot in diameter on our sawmill. So some folks tease that we're kind of like little house on the prairie. Uh, but, you know, we have the sawmill, we have the blacksmith shop, the woodworking shop and everything. As we come around the side here, we cleaned out the equipment shed to do some work. Um, so there's some equipment. That's our big charcoal pile in the back with some of the compost piles. Here we're heading through. We have three rectangles of pigs with eight pens each. So we have the ability to have 24 pens of animals. All those are deep bedded with wood chips and woody biomass. So we have straw, we use uh, recycled horse bedding from the horse farms. We're coming out of what do we call our big paddock here and heading into our upper triangle. Here you'll see some more of the trees. Now that triangle, um, we grazed that May 1st, June 14th and August 2nd. So in one of the upcoming videos, you'll see here where I move them from the upper triangle into what we call our big field. We're approaching that right now. This is the gate going between the upper triangle and the big field. Now, as we come through here, it's glitching on me a little, but that upper peak there where we had the, that bend in the trees, that is the key line for this entire valley. Um, so that part is the, uppermost part where it's economical to store water. Um, so just so everybody remembers that as we go through. I stopped it here so everybody can see that this, the taller grasses here are warm season grasses, that's big blue stem. So right now the herd is grazing up here in this paddock that I'm driving through right now. We're approaching an acre and a half of what we call our woodlot. Uh, we have black cherry, black chokeberry, black oak, chestnut oak, gobbler sawtooth oak, pin oak and northern red oak planted up in here. You can see the deer knock over some of the tubes, so it's always a, a battle to keep healthy stakes in the ground that the deer haven't knocked over, so that's a daily, daily uh, job. This is our neighbor's hay field. The day that I took this video last week, he was doing hay, so you see him off to the side there. As we come over the hill here, that red little shed in the bottom there is what we call the J barn. It has a letter J on it for our neighbors, the Johnsons. But you can see here now how, how, the, uh, how all the trees are planted, and those are planted on the swales and berms of the key line system. Um, and we'll come down here, um, you'll see our herd. Some people call it a furd, a flock and herd. We have our hog island sheep and our Irish Dexter cattle. These are Washington hawthorn and American chestnut trees. We have about 300 American chestnuts that were planted from blight survivors in Maryland. And then we have another 200 planted that are the latest B3, F3 series from the American Chestnut Foundation. So there you see some of our hog island sheep running down into the Porta Hut. And here you'll see some of our Irish Dexter cattle uh, grazing down here. That, brax, that brown spot there was a picture, a spot where we had all those wood chips uh, piled up. And so I moved them out uh, prior in the week and we spread them as mulch for those trees. So we'll, uh, we'll smooth those out here in a little bit. This is a picture from behind our equipment shed. And it shows some of our equipment that we have, post hole diggers, rototiller. That is a compost tea brewer sprayer. There's our manure spreader and some of our movable feeders. There's our wood chipper, our tether. The little green one here, that's our tiny little round baler. That's from Japan. And we use that when we do hay, those are our feeders. Those are some movable rabbit pens in the background and that's our wagon that we use to haul around our cattle panels and our sheep and goat panels, some porta huts. These are the round bale feeders that we use. There's a shot of our chicken coop in the background. We have a, a snow blower and our sickle bar mower, what we use for making hay. There's one of our compost piles in the back there. You can just see the tip of one of our windrows uh, that we used for our um for our compost when we turn it um and then go here to the next slide this is a picture of some of our mature chestnut trees 
They're about five years old. They are in a, a deep bed of wood chips to protect them in mulch. This is a long shot from the other end of the farm from where the J barn was and where I finished that two slides previously. This is a picture from inside the paddock with the herd at the time. So we put 15 frost-free hydrants uh, using equip money throughout the paddock. They're spread around the farm, so we're never more than about 100 feet away from a, a hydrant. These are our sheep staying out. This day, I think it was 96 degrees, so they were staying out. And this is just a shot to show you the hay fields that surround the farm. Here you can see some of our boundary fencing and the, the trees that are on the hedge, what we call the hedgerow that surround the farm. So this is the arrows show you where the key lines were that I had mentioned earlier. Um, there are six of them. The longest is about 1,144 feet, and the shortest, I believe, is around 352. The uh, yellow boxes and squares and rectangles and lines are additions to the farm that aren't shown in this photo. Um, so the one that's closest to the old barn in the center there is our new cattle barn. It had, it's a 40 by 60 building with a 20 foot lean to on the side. And then the equipment shed that has that little box off to it, that is where you saw the sawmill, that lean to we added to house the sawmill. When we originally built everything, we had two rectangles of pig pens with six pens each. We added two pens to each of the existing rectangles, and then we added a set of eight below there, um, and that gives us a total of 24 pens for the pigs. You can see the blacksmith shop, you can see our various straw and uh, horse manure and bedding piles, uh, wood chip piles and finished compost. Here you can see these lines indicate where all the trees were planted for the living hedges. Eventually I'd like to have everywhere where there's a, a metal or a wood fence that we will have living hedges. Um, these were planted with a DNR grant. It was about $52,000 uh, that we got from DNR. It covered the tree tubes and stakes, the trees, the seedlings themselves, and the planting of the, the seedlings. Uh, then it handled a little bit of the money to, pay to, um, to put the tubes and stakes on. Most of that we banged in the ground and did ourselves. But you can kind of see the north-south orientation. So pretty much from that far corner to the lower corner by the J barn is the north-south orientation. Um, we are on Glen Elg soils, uh, so G, G, A, B, and C as far as slopes. We don't have very hard slopes, so keep that in mind as you're looking that we use the single bottom plow and put in our, our key lines. Some of you may be on steeper slopes and may have to do a, uh, a deeper berm and a deeper swale, uh, so just keep that in mind. This is a breakdown that shows a little bit of the size of the paddocks. Um, we have... I, I'm constantly adjusting things, so I believe we have about 25 large fenced-in paddocks at the moment, um, but those can be then broken down into smaller areas as well. We usually give them right now about an acre at a time, roughly. Now, we don't do it exactly, but, you know, just so to give you in mind, we, have a, we give them about an acre a week. Now, in the beginning when the, when the herd, flock, whatever you want to call it, I call it a herd, but... It's combined with the sheep, and it, in the past we did have goats, and we ran them all together. Um, we did mob graze them, and I moved paddocks every single day, but I was putting down, taking down and putting up paddocks every single day. And as the herd began to grow I, grow, I just couldn't stay up with that. So we eventually did electric fencing, where we were doing movable fencing, um, and then by the time we got the physical barriers in around trees, now we have this system. But eventually we'll add to this system and we'll break them down into smaller bits again and we'll mob graze them. So just to kind of keep in mind, this is an evolving farm. So um, it's, you know, by the next time I talk to you, we'll have made 20 different changes as well. So uh, stay tuned for that. Now here you can kind of see what one of the um, rows of trees looks like. I don't know if you can see my cursor pointer, but this is one of the hydrants. Um, we put uh, posts on each side of the hydrant because the large cattle, they want to scratch, and I was afraid they would damage our, our hydrants. So 
um, we, we put those, those wooden posts in the ground to protect the hydrants from them from scratching on them. Here you can see the swale where I'm moving my cursor. And if, for those of you, if you can't see it, it's to the right of this, of the line of fence, the first line of fence. Then you have, this is a T post banged in the ground with a 35 pound post pounder. Um, those T posts are the six foot ones. So about a foot is in the ground and about five foot is up. And then it's four uh, 48 inch welded wire with the two by four squares. Then immediately next to that, about a foot in, is the planting of the trees that will be the living hedge. Then about a foot in from that are the trees that are meant to be the standing trees that will be the silva pasture part of the silva pasture system. They'll be the standing trees. Eventually those trees will have a grapevine trained up them, so we'll have grapes and nuts. Those are chestnut trees, um, both American. These are American particularly these are the B3, F3 series. And then we also have some Chinese. Um, and those are on 10 foot spacing. The trees for the living hedge are on one foot spacing. And then immediately next to that right now, I'm mowing uh, with a 21 inch push mower. Once we get the wood chips in, then we don't have to mow anymore. Then we just weed as necessary. And then we can graze our poultry. Um, we have geese and chickens and ducks that we can graze in there to help keep the weeds down. But eventually that area will be fully mulched and then we will be planting berries, thorn berries, uh, raspberries, blackberries on that side to create another living hedge. So from the fence on this side, just above the swale, this is the berm of the key line where the trees are planted and the berry bushes and the grapevines will be. And then at this side, this other side, again, it's T post and welded wire fencing and those T posts are on eight foot uh, centers. That encompassed area is five foot wide. Then the area from fence line to fence line, the forage, which is the grazing area of the silver pasture system is 48 feet wide. So we have about 53 feet from fence to the next fence, from the tip of this fence to the tip of the start of the next fence, that is the system. Now we did it that wide based on equipment, how many runs of our equipment, if we were making hay or if we were planting, we have a no-till drill that we added at the end of last year. Um, it's 11 feet wide, so it gives me enough room to do four passes with a little extra for tires and wheels and stuff. Um, it also allows me to get all my equipment for, for making hay and anything else that I needed to do. So that was intentional. Um, and I'll just sort of play across with the video here. And then you can see how it snakes through the pasture. And again, we're following the valleys. So we're with the key line, we're taking the water that wants to go to the valleys by gravity. And we're using the swale system, 1% off slope, to push it back out to the ridges. Um, by leaving the grasses high, that allows us to slow the water down. Um, if anything does start to sheet, and we had, you know, we were lucky we didn't get as much rain as others. I know folks have got seven, six inches of rain um, in the, the most recent storm we had. We got about a little over two and a half inches, uh, but it all got soaked in. This is a video of last night. I moved the herd from the upper triangle uh, into the big field. And I'll just, it gives you a little more of a close up. We use the, the gator a lot because it has a lot less impact than a tractor or a bobcat or the heavier equipment or, you know, the pickup truck. Um, there's a joke around that gator that my wife wanted a utility vehicle like that. And I thought it was just an overglorified golf cart, but I got it and it is now the most used uh, piece of equipment on the farm. <laughs> and my wife often teases, you know, do, when do I get to ride my gator? You know, so. Um, so here's the Irish Dexter cattle and the Hog Island sheep. Now I picked those animals specifically for the traits they offered me. They're great mothers, they're great grazers and browsers. Um, they do a wonderful job with the system. They are horned, so uh, for folks who don't like horns, you know, again, you could dehorn them, but um, they do very well with protecting their young. Um, we do have the normal host of predators here. We have coyotes and foxes and owls and hawks and eagles and um, we have uh, skunks and 
raccoons and you know the host of regular predators that you have so here you can kind of see as they're going in the warm season grasses have really started to kick in when we got this hot spell and the uh, cool season grasses started to stun off a little so um, we do have uh, enough seed to cover the property for adding little blue stem this year um, and so we'd be working with that um, we, we we did some through NRCS and the rest of the farm we're going to do on our own but that little piece back there where you see that key line bend where those trees bend that is that key point for this entire valley that i mentioned earlier um, and these are sheep and goat panels that i use the t posts we use those you can just see a good shot of the clips those are double-ended clips and a foot of chain that we use we use three of those on every post because if you do try to push the cattle to graze more than what you know, say I want to plant something, I'm not going to till it or, or mow it. What I'll do is I'll graze it down and then I'll either broadcast the seed or I'll use the no-till drill to put it in. Um, if you push them too hard, those horned animals will, will hook their horns in that fence and start trying to figure out how to move themselves. So those three clips on every post help to prevent that. But if you push them too hard, they will move themselves. So let me move to the next. Now my slider froze up. Hold on, let me get out of here. Uh oh. Hold on a second, gang. I got to stop sharing for a moment and get my PowerPoint back under control here. In the meantime, for those of you who just joined, we're going to be doing questions at the end. Um, you'll see a chat box. Uh, there's a little like speech bubble at the bottom of your screen in a toolbar. If you click on that, it opens up the chat box and feel free to send any questions directly to me, I'm Caroline, um, or to, uh, to Michael. Um, it should list both of us as uh, co-hosts of the meeting and we'll gather those questions to ask Keith at the end of the presentation. Okay, so I apologize. Unfortunately, it, it, it uh, needed me to restart my PowerPoint so we'll uh, we'll restart it here. Apologize for that. Sometimes the technology doesn't want to agree with you. But what we're going to be talking about here next is is how we um, then worked our way through the system. And so what what I in the planning phase, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to look at your farm and what it offers. And so keep in mind all the ecology, all the topography, its orientation, north, south, east, west, which way the winds come. Look at it from an ecological standpoint. In our case, we're in a hickory oak biome. And keep that in mind. You want to look at what nature is giving you from a permaculture standpoint. We're not trying to keep things that want to die alive and make things live that want to die. So if it, if, there's a, if it wants to die, there may be a reason. If it wants to live on your farm, pay attention to those things. And you want to try and focus on the things that want to live and want to be, be fruitful on your farm. So rainfall, amount of sun, your winters, how cold it gets. All those things you want to keep in mind as you're doing your planning. So not everything that we're talking about here is appropriate for your farm. It's, it, all of these things are tools in a toolbox, and you need to keep this in mind as you start to do your planning. For what I wanted to do as a farmer, for what my land offered, and the system that I wanted to put in place, what I'm showing you worked best with me. Also, just because it didn't work for me doesn't mean it won't work for you. Um, and just because it worked for me won't mean it'll work for you. So this is the challenge that we face as we move forward in agriculture. A lot of people in politics and whatever talk about regenerative agriculture as this is this already mastered playbook that everybody has all the answers and we don't. So as you're doing this system, Farming is a business and you want to make sure that whatever decisions you make, if it was a mistake or if it doesn't work, or if it doesn't work the way you thought it would work, that you can recover from that and still be a successful business, okay? So 
with that as a note, we're gonna we're gonna restart the the PowerPoint here again, and I will um, take you through this here. Whoop, no wait, hold on. I gotta restart the share screen first. Okay, so can everyone see that? Carolina Michael? Yes, sorry, I had to Okay, good. Oh, no, no, no problem. All right. So this is a shot of, of our, our big freezer. It's a 10 by 10 by 8 foot walk-in freezer where we store all our meat for sale. But what's standing in front of it, that large letter A, is what's called an A-frame. And so what it is is there's a single screw at the top, and then we opened it like a set of dividers, like you'd walk across a piece of paper. We opened that five foot wide. So that number is important because as we walk it across the field, we're walking it like a, a, a divider set. So we set one end and swing it across, and that means we've gone five foot with that span. So for the key lines, as we lay them out on our farm the way we want to, given our topography, I moved this 20 times and then I set a little flag in the ground and that was 100 feet. And from that 100 feet, we would drop one foot down. That would give us our 1% slope ratio. So what this will look like, and you'll see some pictures a little later on when, when it was still, the ground was a little, a little frozen and the water was running in the, in the swales. This will actually give the impression when you're watching it that water is actually flowing back uphill. But it is not. The key line point of your valley where you put your key point at is actually the high point of the swale. And as it goes back out to the ridges, it drops down that 1% of slope and that's what allows that water to flow back out to your ridges. Now what you'll see in the center here is this is a post level. So it has the three levels on it and you see that little black piece of material there, that is a stretchy piece of material that allows it to attach to the post as you'd be putting in a vertical post that it doesn't fall so that you can line up your post so that it's, it's squared up and level the way you want it. It works great here because it stays affixed to the, to the crossbar of the A-frame as I walk it across the field and I don't need to worry about it falling off or losing it or having it in my pocket and getting it out every time. You can use any level you want on there. And also for folks that, that want to do this or have to do this more often, um, I know some folks from uh, Howard Eco Works might have been tuning in today and they may be doing some layouts. You may want to get one of these that, it, that it's able to do it. However, other folks have actually bought professional surveying equipment. Um, when we were out at Mark Shepard's farm, when I learned how to do this, um, he had both. He showed us this method first. And then he showed us how to do the, the, the fancier equipment that he had. But it does cost a couple hundred dollars. And in this case, I was only going to be doing it the one time once I laid out the fields. So I went for the low-tech version. So just so you're aware of that. And then these are the small flags, you know, metal bottoms, plastic tops. And so as I would move across, every time I, I set the divider edge, the edge of the A-frame, I would put a flag in. And then as I worked my way across, once we got the 20, 20 distances for our 100 feet, then we dropped that one foot with a flag, we'd go back and pull out the other 20. So by the time we were done, we could just follow the topography with the flags in at 100 feet, or you could leave those flags in and follow it the whole time as long as you had someone to pull it out. What we used to set the swale was a simple single bottom plow. For folks with a steeper slope, you may want to use more, you know, a double or a triple or four or whatever to turn that soil over. And then you may want to use a bobcat or whatever else. Uh, to, we flip that soil out of the swale and onto the berm to give us that height. So here you'll see what it looked like once we ran that single plow. You can see there was no fencing at the time. So You've just seen the current day view, and now you see what it looks like when we first started. This was just a hay field. There were no boundary fences. There was nothing out here. You can see the edge of the four board, five board, whatever it is, horse fence um, at the big paddock. 
And what I did after we did the single bottom plow furrow, I took our front end loader on our small tractor. We just had a B2410 Kubota at the time with a four foot wide bucket. And we had about a mile of key lines to do. So you can imagine how long it took me uh, to make that work. And so here we went out through just digging out the furrow. I'd use one or two scoops. Now, later on, I used a rototiller and you'll see that, but this was when I was first trying it. I wasn't doing anything, any surface preparation. I was just doing it and scooping it. And sometimes it took two shots at the bucket to get what I wanted out of it. And it's going down the line and it was slow work. You can see the, the tractor in the distance there with the rototiller on the back. And going. And finally, I reached the end of that line. It took a long time. You can see the grass height right now. So we decided, I thought, well, maybe if I use the rototiller, that would help break things up. And it really did. It really made a difference. So I rototilled on both sides to make it an easier, an easier trip. This is the shot of the end of the row and how it would look. This is the first run. It got much better in working with the soil. And it was very clean. So when I went back into scoop, well, then it made it a lot easier to work with. Um, Here's a, you can see as the grass is starting to get taller and it's a little drier than it was in the in spring there. And this is a depth shot. So mine are only about a foot deep at maximum depth. Now I did do some biofilters, which we'll see later that are three foot in depth and then filled in with wood chips. Uh, but this is what the normal swale looks like. Again, if you're on steeper slopes um, or further distances in your run between your swales, that you'll have more water if you get a, a heavy rain event. You may want to go deeper and have a, a higher berm, so a deeper swale and a higher berm. Um, I was anal retentive and had to go through and clean up my bottoms with a shovel. You probably wouldn't have to do that, but that was something that I did. It took a long time. And then here are the trees going in. Now, these are the trees that are meant for the silvopasture system that are going to grow up straight. They're not the trees that go in that will be bent over for the, the living hedges. Um, and so they're planted in the center of the berm. And these were chestnut trees. You can see as they're going out, you can see the grasses keep getting taller. And that's a, that's a long shot view there. The next thing we did was this is a yeoman's key line plow that we borrowed from the Grazers Network. Uh, Michael had it and uh, it was over at Ron Holter's farm. He's my mentor in the Grazers Network. I picked it up there and then I dropped it back with Michael at the Claggett farm. So this was a three bottom key line plow we had a 105 horsepower tractor that my neighbor brought over and he drove the tractor and I, I kind of guided him where we were gonna be. We have good soils here, so he was able to run that at 22 inches deep. It took all 105 horses, but we made it work. We did two runs on the uphill side of each key line. So that's the first run on the uphill side and now you can really start to see it going into May, June where the grasses were really kicking in this field was essentially an orchard grass Timothy field when we came to the property seven years ago. This is a shot of the biofilter. So on the steeper slopes at the bottom with the two shorter key lines, I thought I would dig these out with an excavator uh, to three foot depth. That's a one foot wide bucket. And we put wood chips in there. So from the wood chip piles from the, the tree care company that I work with, um, we filled those in. On the downhill side, we got a grant from Maryland Association of Soil Conservation Districts to put in two acres of wildflowers. Um, so this is a shot of there. Now, one of the challenges we had is when we came, that area had a lot of Canada thistle in it. And they wanted me to rototill it, and I was very concerned. I didn't like that, but that was their methodology. They wanted me to spray glyphosate and kill everything and then plant, but I wouldn't allow that. Um, so I tried to go with a better uh, methodology. We added 40 tons of compost per acre to that area. And then we rototilled it three times in about, about two to three weeks apart. After the first time, almost all Canada thistle came back. But by the last time, we'd exhausted most of the roots of the Canada thistle. And it all came back as a nice grass. Um, then we planted rye and the, the wildflower mixture. This is what it looked like after the fact when the grass was growing back in with the trenches filled 
Um, so what that was meant to do is once we planted the trees, this gave a continuous line of that vascular, arbuscular, mycorrhizal, fungal network that the trees could then link into, get water and get nutrients as they needed. And if we had a bad rain event and any nutrients washed off, it would get trapped in that biofilter before it um, went off our property. My goal is to conserve every single drop of rainfall that lands on the property and put it into the aquifer in the ground below us. Um, we get about 43 and a half inches a year average. So this is a, a, a shot in the spring when the ground was still a little bit frozen and we had a heavy rain event and you can see what the key lines look like. And the next shot is just a little bit earlier as the water was collecting in the valley and starting to spread back out to the ridges. So this is what it looks like when, when it's working um, when the ground is frozen. That's the only time I see the swales on our farm fill up is in the spring when the ground is still solid and we get a rain event, it can't soak in. Now, the way that we laid out the fences, we took, you know, you could follow where the swale was just as it starts to crest up under the berm. Um, and what we did was we put in the T posts and we used a string. Now, some people use a garden hose. I couldn't get the garden hose to lay the way I liked it, you know, so that it followed the curves the way I wanted it. So I used T-Post and the string to make it work. That's a 35 pound post pounder there. And again, these are six foot uh, T-Posts. We put them on eight foot uh, spacing uh, because the cattle, the, the welded wire is not that strong. So I don't recommend it for bison. Again, these are Irish Dexter, they're a little smaller. So you gotta, gotta use fencing to hold what you're trying to do uh, because this is the fencing that keeps them out of the tree planting. And it's a lot of money if, you, if they get into your trees and start busting off stakes and eating your trees. So uh, just a warning there, whatever you put in, you wanna make sure it works for your system. This we got through NRCS and Equip funding. And then here's a long shot of what it looked like last year after the tree planting went in. Um, the trees are now coming out of the tubes this year. In the future development, people get very upset when you talk about a pond or a dam. It triggers lots of laws and everybody gets all upset. And so I don't call it any of that. I call it holes in the ground. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna dig a hole in the ground. And we're gonna put some uh, clay in it and let the pigs hang out there for a little bit. And if those holes in the ground happen to fill with water, well, I had nothing to do. So um, these will be connected with a pipe that if in a drought, I need to move water. I can use a solar pump and we can pump water and we can actually flood the key lines to do whatever we need to do. Um, even in the, now, you know, when I use a drought, we haven't had drought like California's had drought. We, we've had two, three month droughts, but we've never had a problem using the wood chips and the swale and berm system. Our trees, we have about a 95% survival rate, which is a big deal. Usually you're, you're in the 90 or lower range. Um, but these would be where those holes in the ground would be. And that's the end of the presentation um, as I have it. We wanted to do about you know, 45 minutes or so. Um, I believe we've stayed true to that. The next page here, I just wanted to show you, these are some resources. Um, so originally when I went out, uh, and I, we can talk about that in a few minutes, but I had uh, just, I was frustrated one night. I knew what I had in my head but I couldn't find resources that comprised everything that I had in my head and what I wanted to do. Um, and I just happened to type in, I don't, I wish I could remember what I typed into Google that night, and what it came back with, but Mark Shepard's Restoration Agriculture book had just been released. And I logged in to search a little bit of what he was doing and he was doing a permaculture design course for 10 days out at his new forest farm in Wisconsin. And I signed up right away. Um, the uh, Savannah Institute was running that. And I got to know Peter and Maureen very well. They got married shortly after that. So they now have their own place. I think it's called Mastodon Valley Farm. Uh, but I hired a gentleman by the name of Brandon uh, Angrasani from what Mark Shepard was running called the Restoration Agriculture Institute. And I hired him to come out and help me. And then I hired Mark Kropchik from Keyline, Vermont to help me lay out the Keyline. Um, 
in talking with Brandon, he recommended two people, Harry Green and Chris Newman. I've never dealt with those gentlemen, but he, he recommended them as information sources. And then someone that I met uh, just recently did a webinar in Howard County for Howard County EcoWorks, Michael Judd. He has a operation called Silviculture, and it sounds like we might be working uh, together on some planting of chestnuts here on the farm in the future. Uh, so I put those as resources. Again, the only one that I've ever hired and worked with uh, was Mark Kropchek, and he did a wonderful job. He said he might tune in here. I don't know if he's had the chance to get on. He's a busy fella, but great guy, very helpful. And then we have about 3,000 books in my library, and about 1,000 of those are agriculture related. So it was really hard for me not to go down a rabbit hole in thinking of what resources could I recommend to you guys. So I tried to stick with the basics. P.A. Yeoman's Water for Every Farm, Mark Shepard's Restoration Agriculture. Mark Shepard just came out with a, a book recently, Water for Any Farm. Um, Steve Gabriel has a wonderful book that, you know, as I read it, here I have these years of experience and he's written it down in a couple pages. I'm like, oh man, if I had only had this book when I started here, I thought I had all this good stuff in my head. And he's written a lot of it down on paper for you. So that's Silver Pasture. Uh, Jim Garish does this management intensive grazing book. It's a great book, very helpful. A step, um, you know, kind of encompasses management intensive grazing is Alan Savory and Jody Butterfield, Butterfield uh, Holistic Management. And then this is a book that may not be familiar with many folks. It's from England. It's uh, Murray McLean, Hedges and Hedge Laying. So that is help, very helpful if you decide you want to do hedge laying and create living fences like in Europe. Um, so I, I shared that with Caroline. Uh, I believe she said at the beginning that um, that should be in everybody's inbox. Most folks ask me for resources. That would probably be the distilled essence of the basics that we gave. So uh, that's, that's the end of, of that portion of the presentation. If it's all right, Michael, I'm going to leave this up that if anybody has any questions, I can kind of scroll back to it. Or if you want me to close it, I can do that. Um. Why don't you close it? Wouldn't like okay, to all right, we can do that. Full glory. <laughs> First of all, all right. thank you, Keith. That was wonderful. And while you can't hear it, there are shouts of bravo, bravo. <laughs> and uh, well deserved. So um, I'm going to throw some of the questions at you, Caroline. Feel free to pitch in at any point with questions. So the first question I have for you is, what percent slope were you working with on your farm for the most part? And is it a 1% drop regardless of the steepness of the slope? Um, so all of the things that I saw and what we used here were that the 1% slope is the, the lowest amount you could have that water would still flow. Um, what I would say is, again, there's, I, I won't call them rules, you know, but there's general guidelines to follow. And one of the challenges when you put in the swale system is you're going to have bare soil. So you want to plant that swale as quickly as possible with whatever will grow, grow as fast as possible. A lot of folks use some form of ryegrass. And so... I want to say be very careful if you want to increase that 1% slope to steeper because if you do get a heavy rain event, you're, you're, you don't want water flowing quickly in that system. It's meant to be a slow, gentle, gradual to allow that water to spread out and soak in. Could you do it steeper? Sure. Um, there are different variations of this water management where you may have a wet spot. Now, understand, I am not encouraging you to drain a wetland, okay? <laughs> Please understand. I, when I talk about from an ecological and permacultural standpoint, I want you to respect what nature has put on your farm and try to work with it, not dominate it and bend it to your will. So, but you may have a wet spot and it could be soil related. Maybe you need to leave, use a little gypsum. Maybe you need to chisel it to break some hard pan or use some tillage radishes to, to, to work around that. Whatever tool, but you know, 
you could potentially put a ditch in and use it to take water away from a wet spot and get it to a spot where you'd like to spread the water out or use it. So certainly do that. Um, now the slopes that we dealt with, you can kind of see in the videos, they're not steep, steep slopes. I think, I think the GG, the, the Glen L C, so GGC, I think is three to 8% was our steepest. And those are in the, the corner towards the J barn. So our Southern side and our Northern side up behind the house. Um, so that hopefully that answers your question. I think that more than answered it, yes. So do you think key line is beneficial in a wet year or are its greatest benefits during droughty years? Well, we've, <laughs> we've had the, fortune or misfortune, whatever you want to say, of having some very dry times. And 2018 was the wettest year I've seen in my existence. Um, and it worked equally well at both times. Now, keep in mind, again, this is a full system. So when we start to pull out components, you're going to lose some of the, the benefit of the full system. So Keep in mind what we have is we don't use any herbicides, any fungicides, pesticides. We have a lot of earthworms, we have dung beetles. So while our animals are rotationally grazing and we're pulsing that soil, we have you know between 75 and 100 species on the farm. We leave them grow tall, we graze up to our porch um, which my wife was upset because the sheep got on the porch this year and pooped it up. So, you know, we graze right up to the house. Everything is utilized. Um, and so because of the tall grasses, because of the swale and berm, because we rotationally graze, we have all that life in the soil. We make charcoal. We mix it in our compost piles and use it in our bedding. We feed it to the animals as they graze. Um, all of that combines together with the mulch on top and then the trees, that, that it soaks in really, really well. So if we didn't have some of that, I can't necessarily vouch for the key line system alone what it would do in a drought or a heavy rain year. But in the system that we have, it worked equally well in all the years. Our trees, we've had this, a great survival rate. Um, and in, we don't have enough wood, booty biomass in any given year we need about 6,000 yards a year to cover the whole farm. We haven't covered the whole farm, all the trees uh, where they're on the key line system as of yet. And we've had great survivability. So um, where we did put mulch, where we planted those trees last year is about one to two foot whips. They are now twice the size of the tree, tree tubes. They're in the 10 to 12 foot range, which is phenomenal. Um, so I'm just sharing all those details because it is a, it, I can't necessarily say what it does beyond our system, but it's worked very well in both situations. Um, you mentioned that you participated in the soil baseline study. Have you actually uh, tested for soil biology and have you seen changes if you have? Well, we started this system you know, again, we, we've not sprayed or done anything. Um, the, the tenant who was on here farmed it for hay originally. Um, we didn't let him do any spraying. Um, you know, we let him know that we were going to be taking over the farm as we moved all the pieces and parts up here. Um, so uh, we... Michael, give me your question again. I, I got off track. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's all right. It was, uh, have you seen a change in soil? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So, so what, what happened was we tested right off the bat for our nutrient management, which was organic matter, not for fungal and bacterial biomass. Okay, right. so we did check. We, um, the original test that we had, uh, came back in the 3 to 5% range, but we had already spread compost out. Um, and so we started the grazing, we kept the grasses high, it had been a hay field before. So I think we had a good start. The results that we got from the report for the uh, benchmark study, 
came back that essentially we should keep doing what we were doing. Our numbers were very good. Um, now, I had done, before we moved here, when we were at our old farm yet, I had gone up to the Rodale Institute and trained for a week under um, Elaine Ingham when she was up there. And she taught us how to do the microscope and the compost and the tea and everything and the biology. And so we do have good biology from when I look at it and also the tests that we're getting. But I did not have the money to do the bench line test. It's about, I think the soil food web tests at the time were about $350 a piece. Um, and my view was, as long as I kept increasing the organic matter and did what I was planning on doing, it was going to increase and do better. So I, I don't have a start point to refer to on the biology. That's good. Caroline, I'm going to turn it over to you for a little bit. Sure. I have a couple just real quick numbers questions for a couple things folks wanted repeated. Um, could you tell us again um, how many acres you're so we have So we have 22 and a third acres here. We have just to you know, give some, some, some brief numbers. So as I said, we graze everything. Um, we have 18 Dexters. We have 19 Hog Island sheep. We have 15 Gloucester Old Spot hogs. We have, I think we have 13 geese. I think 20 ducks and like 18 chickens. And then we have six beehives. And then we have about a dozen rabbits. Thanks. Um, and one more number question, the spacing between the rows of trees. Um, so for us, what I did was it's, it's essentially, depending on what you pick as a start point, so whether it's the bottom fence on each row of fencing or the top fence or the, the center trees or the living hedge, it's essentially a 53 foot wide row, mm -hmm. but the fenced area that protects the plantings is five foot wide. So what you're left with between the forage for the forage grazable area is 48 feet. Okay. Thank you. And I, the, the ballpark that I used initially was that's about the length 16 foot. So three of those roughly give me, you know, enough to cover, I got three cattle panels or sheep and goat panels and the largest equipment that I could possibly ever see using was about 16 foot wide. So the, the guidelines that you'll get if you look at permaculture, you look at the silver pasture, or, you know, Brandon or Mark Krawcheck, you can always put another row of trees in between. But we wanted to leave it wide enough that we could start our work and, and do what we had to do um, the other thing that you're looking for is depending on the trees that you're going to plant, you're going to look at eventually those trees are going to grow up and they're going to have shade. And so you want to make sure that you're keeping in mind the shade. So I looked at the trees that were on our property initially and I various times through the day, I just paid attention to where the shade was and I'd run over and throw a, you know, a boot there or something, whatever I had handy. And then I'd come back, I had a measuring wheel, and you know, as part of a tool that help you when you're laying this out, a measuring wheel will help you, but I'd measure it. And that kind of gave me an idea of what the furthest my shadows were spreading at all times of year. Um, and not that we're talking about that at the moment, but just to add it to you, before you start doing any work, now I'm not talking about um, paralysis by analysis, I'm saying before you do any work and you start leveling things or doing anything, just spend some time out on your farm when it's pouring down rain or when it's snowing like heck or when it's windy or, you know, just get a feel for what's happening in your environment on your farm. When you get a six inch rain or a heavy rain, where's the water flowing? What is it trying to do? Where does it want to go? Because um, these are the things you want to keep in mind when you start to lay this stuff out. So, um, I recommend doing that. But then once you got an idea, start doing something, take action. Don't just, cause you could sit for years doing nothing. Just, I know plenty of people that I've talked to for years that still have it all on their computer and boy, does it look pretty, but they haven't done anything outside. So. Um, all right. And let's see, uh, one more, I have one more uh, number question <laughs> here. Yep. Um, 
Uh, we have someone who is curious to know if the farm is your sole source of income. And I was wondering um, if, while you're answering that, if you're a little, if you, if you're comfortable sharing oh, sure. a little yeah. bit more about the financials around the farm. Yeah. So the main, we make about, you know, so not last year, well, not this year. So, so 2019, we made about $52,000. The previous year, about 48,000. Our primary sales that we do is livestock and meat. Um, the majority of everything we do is direct to the consumer. Um, we would like to sell the live animals. It takes a lot of it, a lot of the issues out of uh, it for us as far as liability and whatever. We haul a live animal up to the butcher. Uh, they pay me by check or however for the live animal, and then they pay the butcher directly and tell them how to cut it. And when the meat's ready, they pick it up at the butcher. So ideally, that's how, you know, if we could sell a live animal that way, but what invariably happens, we have some animals that aren't claimed. And so we'll take them up to the butcher, we'll fill out the cut list, we'll pay them ourselves, and then we bring them back and we do it on our freezer. Now in Howard County, you know, it's not like some other places where everybody has a big chest freezer. Here, most people just have their small freezer that's attached to their refrigerator. And it, you know, they don't, they, they panic if somebody talks about buying that much meat at one point, even though they actually save money, it's cheaper that way. But um, so we have found that, that we do keep portions. Now, my wife does work. She has a wonderful job that she loves doing. Um, and so that was kind of what constrained us as far as, far as how far out we could go. Um, and so, and you know, the, the challenge with Howard County and, you know, I say this to, to kind of calm people's nerves. A lot of the mentality out there is bigger is better. So if you don't have a thousand acres, you're not a farmer. Well, I'll put myself up against any farmer out there any day of the week. I'm not afraid of them and their thousands of acres. I, I took my entire life to make the money that we could buy this farm. So everything's paid for. Everything you see, there's not a dime of debt on anything. And it was $869,000 to buy that 22 acres. And that's what it bought me in Howard County. Now, if I was somewhere else, I could have bought a pretty nice spread for that. Um, but I'm focusing on trying to be, so I look at it, I think it was a Native American quote that we loan the land from our children, not that we inherit it from our fathers or whatever. But I'm looking at trying to get a system in place that then any of my descendants or whoever buys the farm, if they're not interested, will be able to have the works for them. And then they can worry about trying to expand and add land to it. Um, so just, just to put people, if you've got a half acre, you got five acres, don't let the big acreage folks bother you. Just do what you got to do and make it right. I'd put you up against any of them too, Keith. <laughs> a quick follow-up question on that. Actually, we had one, um, uh, so a couple folks are messaging me and telling you, thank you for being open about that. That's very appreciated. I think a lot of times the financial situation of farms is not something that's super transparent. Right. Um, yep. And just to clarify, um, you were working other jobs before you started in agriculture. Um, and so that's part of how you ended up saving the money. Yeah. So, so I didn't, you know, I didn't know how much time we were going to have, so I didn't go into it too much. So when I was, the, the history to that is, you know, our family, as I said, had been farming for over 400 years. But before I was born, my grandfather, he had a horrible accident. He was lit on fire and burned much of his body. Um, that was back in 59. And the four boys, my dad included, and my, my grandmother had to, had to run the farm. They had a dairy farm with 50 cows. Uh, my grandfather, that happened in May. He got home from the hospital in October on Halloween. Well, he wouldn't be normal for another two years that he could really help. Well, that spring then the barn caught fire and the family got the cows out of the barn. But when the fire trucks came, it scared the dairy cows and their creatures a habit. And they ran back in the burning barn and half of them were killed. And then the insurance money was only a percentage, so it didn't pay for the, everything. So they had to push a pole barn into effect as the milking area. Well, they they spent the money that they got from the insurance to buy cattle to replenish their, their income source. Well, some of the cattle that came in had um, brucellosis. Well, then the, the state quarantined herd. They couldn't sell anything off. They couldn't bring anything on. And they lasted about five years of that. Now imagine going five years without any income. You know, they were, they were pretty self-sufficient group of folks, uh, but it caught up with them. They couldn't pay the mortgage anymore. And so the bank was going to sheriff them. 
And so they worked out a deal. If they did a quick sale, they wouldn't share them. And that's what happened. And so in 61, they lost the farm. And the family still worked in farming. My dad was a dairyman for two different dairy herds. And by the time I came on the scene, we didn't have anything. So I had to start from scratch. So as a kid, I worked on all my neighbor's farms. And I came up in the glorious 80s. And the, our guidance counselor said, well, Keith, we're in Pennsylvania. We got a great ag school. And if you want to go into agriculture, because that's what I love. She said, what do you love? And I said, farm. And uh, she said, well, we got a great school. We'll get you into farming. I said, no, wait a minute. I don't want to be broke the rest of my life. And that was my, you know, and, and that was the deal. Everybody said to me and my family, don't even bother. You know, I watched families that were depression area, Pennsylvania Dutch families go bankrupt. Now, how do you bankrupt the Dutchman that's never spent a dollar? When my grandmother passed away, we cleaned tinfoil and saran wrap and newspaper that she had saved out of her house. How do you do that? Well, they said, if you're going to do it, if you don't listen to us, which I didn't, and you want to do it, stay out of debt and try and figure out ways to do as much as you can with what you have on the farm that you're not using off farm inputs. Um, and so anyway, that's how, that's kind of the history. So I loved the ocean, which was miraculous since I was landlocked in farm country, Pennsylvania. And ultimately I became a ship's officer in the merchant Marine. And I, you know, you can make a lot of money sailing around the world. And so while I did that, I looked at what was working in all the countries that I visited. I tried to figure out what was working and what wasn't working and bring that back. And then eventually, you know, we saved, we were very frugal. We didn't spend any money. Um, and then we used that money to be able to buy the, buy the farm and buy the stuff we needed. So, so Keith, um, one, one of the questions is what advice would you give to someone new to farming who's interested, particularly in silver pasture? And I would sort of throw in there as part of the question, I know you've done some interesting trainings. What are the trainings you found most helpful, whether for a new person or someone with someone farming experience? Um, well, the first thing I would say is don't get discouraged. The stuff that we're talking about here today, if you went and had a candid conversation with the neighboring farmers and everybody else, they'd say I'm a nutbag that ruined a perfectly good hay field planting trees and they don't understand what I'm doing half the time. Um, but I love them. They're good people. You know, they're, they're not mean. They're, they just, you know, if you don't have the information, if you've never been exposed to something, how can you blame somebody? So don't get discouraged. That's the first thing. You're going to go to NRCS. You're going to go to the soil conservation districts. You're going to talk to other farmers. And most of what we just talked about, they're not even going to have a clue. Um, you know, you'll go to, if you're doing civil pasture and you talk to your county forester, you know, my forester's great guy, James Iredam for Howard County, and he confided in me later. Once, once he realized I wasn't a psychopath and I knew I, I, I wasn't crazy and I meant to do this, this was going to happen. He confided in me that Keith, after I left your place, I had to go and look up Silva pasture. I had never heard of any of these things you were talking about. So that's the, the, it, it sounds simple, but it's hard not to get discouraged as you try and find people. So I would say, Find other people that are interested in doing what you want to do. Look at the resources that I gave you. You know, I'm available. The Grazers Network has great mentors. The Future Harvest, you know, one of the things that I enjoyed about Future Harvest, now keep in mind, I serve on the board of directors for Farm Bureau as well. But when I first came to Farm Bureau, folks were like, what is this dude doing? We don't even understand. Whereas with Future Harvest, I was in a room full of a lot of people that I didn't have to explain myself from square one. So, it's, it's, you know, or PASA or Acres or, you know, there's, there's a host of other entities out there that, that now exist that, you know, I was doing stuff that now has a name. Well, it didn't have a name when we were, when we were trying to do it, you know. Um, so th that finding like-minded individuals, not getting discouraged. You know, Joel Salton, who I'll, I'll, I'll talk about here, he's not in the list of resources that I gave. And unfortunately, I apologize. I can't remember which book he has it in. And maybe it's all of them. I don't have it's in the other room. I don't have it handy. But he had a list of books on his bookshelf at that time. And 
that is where I started. I read Joel's books. I liked his philosophies. And I looked at his book list and I started there. And those books led to more books and more books. And, you know, um, and, you know, the way that I do that, and I'm not, I don't have stock in Amazon or anything else, but I have an Amazon Visa card. And I put all my purchases on the Amazon Visa card and I get what they call points. And then I can use those points to buy books. I get free, you know, the free, the free points and then I get these books. And so that's one way that I feed my book habit. And I, you know, I have to buy the equipment anyway. And that way then I use it to get stuff. But you, there are a lot of credit cards that will do that. And you can buy them from your local bookseller. I go to a lot of the used book places and some of these books are $15 and you get them for 50 cents at the used book place. So um, that's the best I could say, you know. <laughs> that's very good. I think we'll do another two or three questions and then try to wrap it up unless there's okay. the burning ones. So um, I've got one here, sheep and cows together, you say. Do you think the cows help protect the sheep, uh, particularly the younger lambs? Or do you do some other means to protect your lambs? Um, so we have a livestock guardian dog named Bonnie. Uh, we had two, Molly, her mother, uh, passed away a few years ago. Um, I really like, they're great Pyrenees, or you know, she is great Pyrenees. I really like them, but um, she was an adoption. And so part of the adoption was that she wouldn't be used as a traditional livestock guardian dog living out in the field. But she does, she's very protective of any livestock that we have grazing in with her. Now the rams, hog island sheep have a bit of an attitude regarding predators. So it's not un uncommon to see her getting chased across the field yiping as the, the sheep are chasing her, you know. Um, so they do a pretty good job of protecting themselves. And they are together, but they do they do separate themselves, you know. Now, if I bunch them up, they'll kind of, you know, they'll be closer. But if I give them enough space, they do keep kind of to their own. Um, I haven't had, you know, we don't have wolves, we don't have bears, we don't have panthers. Um, they are smaller. They have their horns. Now, some of our sheep have horns. Some of them do not. It just is the, the quirk of the breed and the individuals. Uh, but all of, our, all of our cattle do. Now, we did have sheep. We had San Clemente Island goats, but they just did not thrive in the system. Now, could goats thrive in the system? I liked what they did to the soil and with the browsing. Um, it could have been that, you know, San Clemente is a very rare breed, and so a lot of the people that are raising them, they deworm them, they feed them, you know, grain and everything else, sweet feed. So it could be that inadvertently – in trying to protect the breed, they've grazed, they've bred out and fed out some of the things that made them a great breed and very uh, hardy to, to start with. I don't know that for certain. I love the San Clemente breed, but they just did not thrive. But the sheep and the cattle, the Irish Dexters and the Hog Island sheep did. So again, as you make your choices, you know, you, I've heard people add donkeys and, you know, llamas and other stuff. Um, but we haven't, by moving them and, and with the attention we pay them, we haven't had predator problems. What we have had problems with is, is with climate change and with we've had anywhere from 106 on the thermometer down to negative 20 here. And if we get a really wet spring, I usually breed the animals so that they're having their babies the end of March, beginning of April. Um, one of the reasons we built that cattle barn is because one year we had such a wet, cold spring, our animals couldn't get the babies dry and, and warm, and we lost several. So we did that cattle barn, and if we ever have that issue again, we can run them into the cattle barn and get them out of the worst of the elements so that they can have their babies. Um, same thing with the sheep. We use the old barn um, for the sheep. I will separate them when they start having babies, and we keep the rams out until November, uh, so the rams are all grazing in an area on their own. Um, because it's roughly a nine-month cycle with the Dexters, once you get them in sync, I leave the bull in with them all the time. Now, we don't do any AI. Um, so, again, if you've got bulls and boars and, and, and um, rams, you got to be aware. They're, you know, they, our bull, he's a great bull. I raised him since he was a baby. But one of the females was in heat the other day, and he sure did not like me coming over and trying to do anything, even though I'm the alpha male. So just understand these. These are critters that could kill you, so don't don't get complacent. Be aware. Um, so. 
So I'm going to ask you one more question, Keith. But this is the opportunity for anyone who's listening, ask your question now, because we're going to wrap it up in just a couple of minutes. So um, a question for one person is, uh, are the chestnut trees available commercially? And what varieties do you recommend? Well, I didn't have a particular variety that I selected. So they are available commercially. And, you know, you can, if you, there's different groups on Facebook. There's, I think, the Northern Nut Growers. Um, I haven't bought some chest, I, the first batch of chestnuts, Chinese chestnuts that I bought from Mark Shepard, um, he had a separate entity that he would sell. Now, I haven't gotten any from him since, so I'm not sure if he still does them. Um, you can buy them from some of the, like, Maryland has tree nurseries. The state has tree nurseries that they operate. Um, you need to be a little careful if you're using the tree nurseries because a lot, my understanding is a lot of the um, people that buy from the state tree nurseries are planting in residential neighborhoods. So in the case of residential neighborhoods, they don't necessarily want a very prolific nut harvest. They get mad when they got all those nuts in their yard and they got to mow. So oftentimes they might be selecting for trees that produce less quantity of a harvest. So I would recommend if you're going to be going for, a, you know, production on your farm in the chestnuts that you need to understand go for more of the people that are growing them for nut production now the challenge is you also have to understand you may want to try and get from people that are growing in whatever kind of system you're trying to create because again if it's a commercial system where they're being propped up with various fungicides and herbicides and you know pesticides they might be a commercial tree but they might not be the best and healthiest for the system that you want to try and do. Um, also keep in mind in a silver pasture system, one of the pieces that is often ignored and not talked about is the Food Safety Modernization Act. Chestnuts are not an exempted tree. So in my system, it's considered that they're unfit for human consumption because I graze the animals in them and around them. The same with our orchard trees. So if I wanted to sell anything regarding that, I'd have to put in some sort of kill step. Either I, I heat it up and make jams and jellies or I roast the nuts and then sell them. There'd have to be some sort of kill step in order to be able to deal with that. And then you have to have, you know, depending on how deep in the rabbit hole you wanna go, you have to have the commercial kitchen to do it. You have to have the expertise to do it. You'd have to be insured to be able to do that and sell it to the public. So, um, and just keep that in mind if that's that a lot of these books talk about it like well you just raise these trees and then you sell it to the public and make millions of dollars and what they're forgetting is there's zoning there's all sorts of requirements that you got to sort of dance through in order to be able to make it work so um yes they're available commercially you know there's many out there if you google it you can find various references and some of the references that i talked about you can talk to them about who their suppliers are um, but again, just keep some of those things in mind as you select where to get trees. Okay, while we're on the subject of trees, there's a very practical question. Um, do you think the tree tubes are necessary if the livestock are kept from disturbing the trees with that solid fencing? Um, that's a very good question. And in my experience, so with the trees that we planted, I tried both methods. I tried just planting them without tubes and tried planting with tubes. The trees will grow a lot faster in the microclimate that the tube creates in my experience. However, it will be taller and more spindly, so you may have to keep it there for five years until that, if you're, so again, the tubes that I'm, so I'm doing a little differently in the way we're making our hedge than they do in Europe. The traditional thousands a year old method is that you would let that tree get where it's healthy and standing on its own five, seven years maybe. And then you do a long diagonal cut, a plinch or a pleach, depending on who you talk to. And what it does is the bark stays on the side of the tree that you didn't cut. And it lays over and that, continues to feed the tree and keep it alive. 
that's the way it's normally done. What I'm doing is I'm taking them when they're a year or two old and I'm actually bending them and weaving them. So it's woven the same way as a traditional hedge in Europe, but I'm actually weaving the live tree and not doing the cut. So it keeps the bulk of the bark on. Now you may get some cracks and whatever that may have to heal as you bend it, but that's the difference. So for those, I don't mind them being tall and spindly because that's what I want. I want them to be able to weave them in between the oak stakes that we put in the ground. Now on those, again, we're a foot apart. And that's my own thinking. It may not work. We may be screwed. I may have 700, 7,500 pieces of dead tree in a couple of years, but I think it will work given what I've seen. If you're planting and you want them to raise up, then you may have to leave the tubes in place a little longer. Now, the ones that I did not do anything with, they are after the same time, maybe a third, at the max, half the size of the ones that were in the tubes. Um, so it, it, it definitely did a big uh, benefit for growing. Also, I have not, on my farm now, keep in mind, we have all the predators. I don't shoot or try in other ways to kill the predators. I try to manage, if I lose an animal, it's because I screwed up is the way I look at it. Something in my system wasn't effective to keep them separated and healthy. So I have all the predators there. Now, some people complain that you don't want to use mulch around your trees or you don't want to do the tree tubes because the voles will come and destroy your trees and other pests will come and destroy your trees. I believe the reason that we haven't had that problem is because we have so much food in other areas for them to get shelter and get something to eat. If we had grass mowed to two, three inches, we herbicized all the grasses around the trees and we had nothing but bare soil, that tree tube would look pretty damn good to me if I was a mouse or a vole or another critter. So I'm just sharing again, it's where some of the system may be what's creating the protection that we have. Like we don't have, the deer will go in and they'll scratch themselves on the stakes and bust the stake off but they don't seem to be destroying the trees and destroying the, the tubes. But again, we have so much grass and other protective cover that they can hide in and eat that I think that is, is sort of swaying why we haven't had the deer damage that a lot of other people that are trying this system are experiencing. So that's a long rounded way around the, the tree there, but that's, that's the answer. Yes, well, that's an excellent answer. Caroline, do you have any last questions? Uh, I do. Um, uh, I think there was another question about the trees um, in general, and one was just if you could talk very briefly about why you chose to use Osage oranges in part of your system. Um, and part of that question, there's a, another question as well, which um, was asking about what you do when there are non-native trees in the system and if they start, you know, competing with the ones that you want there because they're actually better at thriving in the environment. Well, so I may need you to catch me up. Can you say the first question again? Sorry, yeah, that was a long one. Um, why right. Osage oranges? Okay, all right. So essentially there's, it's a, it's, a, it's a hard question to answer. So ideally I would love to have natives in the system as they were meant to be. Um, however, Sometimes you have to look at your environment and, you know, I don't know the answer as to what climate change is going to bring. I, you know, some of the old temperature maps that show what area you're in GB, you know, 7B or 6, whatever, they're not necessarily holding the way they did anymore. And with that, some of the ranges of trees, you know, I mentioned that we were in a chestnut oak biome. Well, that was American chestnut you know, just a little bit over 100 years ago. And not that the trees have died out, but they continue, they're still there. They're just still trying to send up shoots from the root systems and, and come back for the ones that weren't chopped down or, you know, killed. So it's, it's a challenge. You need to look at this. You know, I know plenty of people that's planted bamboo and it's out and running wild. So I would caution you to be careful what you're trying to interject into the system. Now, Osage orange, the reason why I chose the trees that I did, 
I tried to look what was going on here. I planted 1,500 willow trees because I wanted to do baskets. Um, part of what I'm trying to do, we planted the black locust because they make great post, the eastern red cedar. They make great rock-resistant wood. The oaks make great fence boards and building materials and firewood. So I'm trying to think, you know, 1,500, 100 years in the future, what are we going to need? What are my descendants going to need? But at the same time, I'm also looking at what's, what's trying to survive here. So the Osage Orange, the natives used it for handles and for tools, for bow and arrow. It's also the hottest burning BTU wood in North America. And it makes a great thorn. So the soil conservation districts used hundreds of thousands of miles of Osage Oranges for shelter belts to stop the Dust Bowl back in the 30s and 40s. Um, and there are evidence, so the, the, the champion Virginia Osage Orange predates the arrival of Columbus. So what that shows us is that the natives actually traded tree species that they felt were valuable and that they thought had some sort of benefit. And they actually had these um, trade routes that were established to, to transfer this around. So I used Osage Orange. They were trees that were growing here. Um, and we planted them again, mainly because of the thorn and the, um, the uh, BTU value of the wood. Um, and that's, that's kind of a long-winded answer, but, but all the trees had a purpose of why we chose them. Those willows all died. I spent 15, I had 1,500 of them that I planted and they all died. And so we decided to stop using willow and what we've replaced it with is mulberry. Mulberry wants to grow great here. It's great for the wildlife. It grows, I mean, like you look away, you turn back and the mulberry grew some and you're like, whoa, what the heck just happened there? But that's on my farm, you know, so willows may be great for other places. And I think we'll close with this question, which is more of a request. Uh, would you be willing to share your PowerPoint? Uh, would you be comfortable doing that? Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, I don't know that there's a lot there that you're going to get from it, but I'm happy to share it. Uh, well, uh, yeah. it's requested by two different people who yep, yep, to yep. take notes. The main, the main piece I would... I would encourage you to take is that resource page that I gave, which should hopefully be in your inbox. You know, if you, if you got, it. if you don't reach out to one of us, I mean, we can, we can get it to you, but yeah, I'm happy to do it. I just had lots of trouble trying to with email and everything else. It didn't seem to want to do anything with saving. And the only way I could see getting it to work is with some sort of thumb drive. And unfortunately, you know, I've, I've been trying to stay socially isolated on the farm, so we haven't been taking visitors, but um, that's, that's my only reluctance. I'm happy to share the power. Okay, well, we will get that out. And um, a couple of people have very kindly sent me some other really good resources that are, you know, relevant for your talk. Great. And we'll include those uh, when we send out um, Keith's presentation. So, Thank you all very much. Um, it was delightful having you, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks Thank again, you. everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy, okay? Thanks, everyone, so much for joining. Uh, Michael and Caroline and David and Sophia, if she's there, did you want me to stay on then? Because well, we can debrief quickly. I, I, I I saved until like three o'clock for everybody. So I didn't know how long we'd have and what questions would be there. So yeah. why don't we stop the recording? Okay. Um, so, and